Welcome back, everyone. This is the Flow Check Podcast. Flowcheckpodcast at gmail.com. You can check us out on YouTube. We're not live again. We're hoping to go live later on the week. So for those of you who enjoy seeing our faces as we record, you have to be a little bit patient. Back from Arizona is my co-host, Gordon Mack. Gordon, good morning. Good to be back. Got in last night. Uh, watched a depressing Eagles football game. Get blown out by the Cowboys. But everything's okay. I got my Phillies. I have Ben Simmons still causing chaos in the sports world of Philadelphia. There's just a lot of Philadelphia going on in my mind as being from there and dealing with their sports. But we're coming up on London Marathon this week. We have more cross country. Mm-hmm. We have Chicago and Boston in two weeks. So I'm going to hopefully be able to lean into the running world that is just distraction from Philadelphia sports world. Mm. Yeah. When you were in Arizona, did you take a side trip to L.A.? To try to convince Ben Simmons to come back? Did not, could not find okay. time. It was busy, full schedule. was there for a wedding and uh, I couldn't, I couldn't make any adjustments to my itinerary. So, <laughs> well, it probably would have had a negative impact because it seems like Ben is going the, the opposite direction there. Um, mentioned London coming up this weekend, Sunday, October 3rd, live on a flow track in, geez, all sorts of places, Gordon, right? Oh, for London Marathon? Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Well, notably, US. it's live United in the U.S. States. Yes, United exactly. States. I mean, for those who've been following our uh, marathon coverage, we sometimes have the rights in Canada or Australia or U.S. or U.K. This situation, London, it's live in Australia, Canada, and the U.S. So, hey, if you're from Alabama, Alaska, Hawaii, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. Arkansas, Manitoba, South Dakota, Alberta. I can name all the states, man. I can keep going. You know, new found. I'm doing Florida. provinces up here. Oh, provinces. Province. Oh, yeah. British Columbia. Uh, British Columbia. Ontario. Quebec. Ontario. The, the, yeah. Is Quebec Wait, is, a city. is that a city or a province? Oh man, Quebec? see, we're losing. Quebec is a city. I used to learn Ontario. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know my Canadian. Um, we should get some emails. They're going to teach us the, the like. Oh, you were right. Are there eight of them or nine? Eight or nine? You were Nova right. Scotia? I was wrong. Quebec is the city. Ontario is the province. Um, they're all great. Okay. They're all all great. great. We'll we'll do our rankings next <laughs> pod on Canadian provinces. We're doing a live show. By we, I mean me and a guest. Um, watch party style. So, 2.30 a.m. Central Time. This is not a drill, folks. 2.30 a.m. Central Time is when we're starting. So, you know, if you're overseas, it's going to be perfect. You can wake up, watch the marathon. Live on YouTube, we're going to have a, a second screen experience. So you can watch the race on, on Flow Track. And then the Flow Track Podcast YouTube channel will have myself and Cathal Dennehy, long time running journalist, covers marathons, covers track and field. He's been around uh, the sport for many years, written for a whole bunch uh, of publications, a good voice in the sport. So he and I will be chopping it up, as they say, for like three hours, basically. During this race, we're going to do a pre-show, Gordon. We're going to talk during the entire race, and then we're going to wrap it up after. So that's all going to be on the Flow Track Podcast YouTube channel. So head on over there on Sunday morning or late, late, late Saturday night. Yeah, or I'm not sure what it is in Australia. That time zone, I don't like know Wednesday the time zone. They're in. they're like on a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Australia is always on a Wednesday. Yeah, or yes. if you're in Australia, it may not be on a Sunday. It could be a Saturday or Monday. We don't know. But, yeah, it should be fun. Got you and uh, Cathal talking about the marathon. It's going to be good. London Marathon, man, it's coming close. Deep, One of the deepest marathons we've seen. Mm-hmm. We're already coming off of the Berlin. We saw what Berlin mm-hmm. produced. Now we can see what London does. And we'll see. I think it's going to be like – that's what's going to be interesting about these marathons, starting with Berlin all the way through to New York, is seeing, like, which one holds up. Like, which one mm-hmm. ends up being the best marathon? Berlin has set the standard of what they got. We had a potential world record attempt that kind of fell flat. We'll talk about that a little later. But mm-hmm. 205s, 206s, we'll see what London right. produces, and we'll go along. And by the end of the fall, we'll be able to power rank the 2021 marathons. Well, I remember it before the marathon. Well, when we once we got the fields, we ranked them based on which one had the best American field, which one had the best – overall field and i think if you asked at the beginning which one's going to produce the quickest time a lot of people would have said hey it might be berlin because 
no, no Kipchoge, you might just go to, to Bekele. I'm talking about on the men's side of things. But then we see a 205, Gordon. And you never see a 205 in, in Berlin. You know, seeing, a, seeing a 205 is like seeing a 358 mile at BU. You're just like, wait a minute. That's the, that's the A heat? Like, that's crazy. It's like seeing a 1001 in Claremont, right, in like April. It's like, no, no, no. I need to see like a 985 with like a plus seven win. Like, that's what you normally are accustomed to in these venues. So 205 for the men, women 220. Quicker on that side of things, relatively to speaking, but I guess this is what happens when you have a field built around one person, and that one person is inconsistent in the marathon and has, yes, you could say has a chance at a world record, but it was always going to be a stretch for Bekele. And then once he isn't clearly in 201 shape, then everything kind of gets slower and falls apart from there. Now, they went out quick. Men went out sub-61 here. So you, you combine those two things together of, hey, this field's really not that deep, and they're going out at this crazy pace. And then the end result is, hey, 205 marathon, which is a quick time for a, a previous era. But for this era, you look at 205, and you're like, okay, well, something must have been off. Question for you. Do you think Bekele would have been more successful, probably have a quicker time in general, if he didn't announce and put in his head and just have it all built around a world record attempt, if it was more just built around running a strong, successful, potential winning race, like yeah. you think yes. his result would have been faster? Yes. And he does this every single race. And I feel like it's because he thinks he's chasing history as opposed to just trying to win the race. And because Kipchoge lays these markers out there that are basically impossible. Bekele's like, well, how do I one up this guy? Well, you gotta go 159, right? Or you got it on an on a unofficial course, or you gotta be running the 201 mid. Now he he like he did it once to his credit in Berlin two years ago, right? Just two seconds off the world record and almost did it. But that was the that was the outlier performance. So yeah, you know, hit it in the middle of the fairway a couple times. You don't need you don't always need to try to get to the green, right? You can you can just hit a solid. Do a nice solid 203, get a win in Berlin, and then move on from there. Especially because he's trying to double back and go to New York now. So why put all that pressure on you when really the goal for this fall season should have been, hey, can I get two major wins? Because that'd be unprecedented. Two major wins in one season. Nobody's done that. Now, nobody's had the 2021 calendar to work with, but he could have made history in his own way. Not taking anything away from Guyadola, who's been a, a, a solid runner at, at Berlin in the past. But when you, you're right. When you set the bar that high, everything else looks like a disappointment. And you're, you're not even coming away with the win. I was talking to a, a pro runner at Flagstaff uh, over the weekend about Bekele's performance. And reporting. in general, he basically – what? Reporting. You're reporting. That's good. You're yeah, out reporting, there doing some, reporting. some journalism. Doing some journal, capital J journalism. Uh, basically, kind of on par with what you said, how, you know, always the, the it's not conducive to always be going for that one world record. And that yeah. one thing that is so impressive about Kipchoge is the consistency and that mm -hmm. his average, like Kipchoge's average marathons are incredible. He doesn't have one good one and then a bunch of, 207s, right? He has yeah. consistently thrown thrown down quick times. And maybe Berkeley, his focus should be on getting at consistency. Like get run a 204 consistently before you try yeah. to then break the world record a, a second. Like have multiple consistent 203, 204s on your belt. So therefore, when you're actually going for a world record, you have a better baseline because to like plan on catching fire is not really a good strategy, right? Yeah, you can catch yeah. fire sometimes. It happens, right. but you don't plan on it, right? So it's easier to yeah. get the fire when you've been con more consistent, right? So Yeah, uh, but at this point, yeah. at this point though, he's 39 years old. I think that's opportunities basically passed to just cuz he doesn't the problem with the strategy is each time you miss it just makes you want to swing bigger the next time. Yeah. Right? Because now you got to make up for the last one. And you're like, well, how many opportunities do I have? And the whole marathon part of his career 
I felt was set up as this is just going to be adding legacy points to what he did on the track. And then it got really complicated when Kipchoge just piled, like you said, 202s on top of 203s, on top of course records, on top of sub twos. And there's just no competition for that. So now he's, he's in this hole here where the only way he digs himself out is by somehow one-upping the greatest marathoner of all time. It's just an impossible position to put yourself in. Yeah, he's basically taking a bunch of half-court shots, hoping one goes in. Whereas Kipchoge is just Steph Curry shooting a bunch of threes, like nine out of ten every time. Yeah, I mean, and Bekele's, Gordon, he ran yeah, two. He ran two oh six. He ran two oh six forty seven in this race. Two oh six forty seven, and we talked about his success rate before. His completion rate of these marathons being at about. 50%. And again, 20141 can't take that away from him had has had some other good marathon performances, but there's been there's been some 206s out there as well too. There's been some races where he's you know not in contention at all for for the win. And then you read these quotes after. Did you see the 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 quote uh it's in the Nation in in Kenya where he says um my plan is not only to break the world record before I retire. Everybody's talking about sub two hours. So why not? One day I will try this. I know it's hard work. I feel confident. So let's do it and see. I mean, you admire his One day? His confidence. <laughs> You're 39, yeah, like, man. Like, what are you going to do? Again, I admire his confidence here. But this is just sort of – this is this is getting to the point where it's like you got to show something at, at a certain point, a little more consistency. Now – Maybe because the sub two stuff is unofficial, maybe he figure out figures out a way to tilt the thing, tilt the the race setup more in his advantage and can get it. But to think that he could run faster than he he himself ran in, in 2019 in what looked to be a, a perfect race is hard. I mean, he's chasing the what the 2019 version, so the 36, 37 year old version of himself, which was really good which was really good. And there's no evidence that that's back. So I admire his confidence in himself that he just keeps going for it. I just wonder how many more of these do we go through before we stop taking it seriously as a world record attempt? Yeah. It's not to put it into an NBA comparison, like how many off season three point shot highlight reels of Ben Simmons do you need to go need through to, to realize yep. he's not actually yep. going to shoot threes in an actual professional game? Because we're on year four or five of Ben Simmons doing that. And we're on multiple years of Bekele saying, I am going to be the GOAT at the marathon as well. And yeah. everyone's like, dude, we, we already have that GOAT. His name's Ilya Kachogi. Sorry, it's okay. You had a great track career. You're one of the GOATs yeah. at track. But that's great. You should like be proud yeah. of that. You don't need to do more, you know. Mo Farah is not trying to do more in the marathon. He realized his goatness is was surely purely only in track. I think Bekele. Yeah. I, but the problem is Bekele does have that two hundred one. So once you have that two hundred one, then you're like, well, yep. it's like yeah. that little temptation. like I have that, I have that spark. Yeah. But that, that was fire. I think mm -hmm. more and more we're realizing the two hundred one is the outlier, not the yeah. the norm. And it's okay. Have your outlier. And I mean, he's just not that he should give up and just retire, but like just yeah. uh, every time you step on the track uh, on the road, you're just saying, I'm going to break a world record. I'm going to break two hours. It's like, yeah. eventually you're like, all right, you got to start backing it up because it's not like it would be different. We'd have a different perspective. If you ran like 202, we're like, oh, wow. All right. He, he had an honest attempt at it. Like he went for it. Yeah. But like yeah. when you're DNFing and DNSing and 206ing, it's like, all right, it's not it's not the same. So yeah. maybe we'll I mean we're gonna watch, right? We're gonna watch him in New York when he runs try to run. So we're gonna watch him the next time he says he's gonna break world record. So hey, yeah. we'll still watch. As much as we'll, well criticize, so we'll still watch. You <laughs> and you go back to twenty to th 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 this was his first one in twenty twenty one, right? He he didn't run one in twenty. 20 because he scratched London. You go back to 2019, he finished one. It was amazing, 201.41. You go back to 2018, he ran a 208 and got sixth in London and then DNF'd in Amsterdam. You go 2017, he had DNFs in Dubai and then Berlin. In the middle of that, he got second in London with a 205. 2016, 
He got third in London, then won Berlin in 2003, so that was pretty solid. And then his first year doing the marathon, Paris, his debut, 205, and then Chicago, 205.51, and got fourth. So, yeah, there's more misses. J- judging on his very high bar, there's more misses in there than there are hits. The New York thing is interesting, though. I like the New York move because you know what they're not going to be talking about in New York? You know what two well, words they're not going to say? And if they say these two words, I'm going to take this microphone and I'm going to throw it on the ground. World record. Anybody talk about world yeah. record, the New York City Marathon, stop. Stop. Stop talking about it. I don't want to hear it. So they won't. That'll be off. Now, maybe they'll say course record. He's going to beat Jeffrey Mute's course record. But course records don't have the prestige as world records. So that's good for him. That's good for him. And it's his first, right? Because he hasn't run in an Olympic marathon before. He hasn't run in a world championship marathon. All those marathons I just listed to you, Gordon, Chicago, Berlin, Amsterdam, Paris, they're all fast. They're not New York and Boston. So this gives him a new opportunity. Maybe he is better at these types of marathons, right? Just as we, you know, we haven't seen Kipchoge in these sort of marathons. We don't know what Kipchoge would look like in a New York or Boston. We've seen him in championship marathons and he's Kipchoge, so we know he'll be fine. But again, we don't know. So maybe he can be a grinded out runs. Maybe he runs a, a, a 207, 208, but wins the thing by a minute and has a New York City Marathon title to his name. I just hope he actually runs it. And I'm, I'm concerned now that he's not even going to run it. But I want him to run it because I just want to see the Kale in a different setting. And I think a new setting will do him a lot of good. The elite runner who I spoke to in flag who mentioned that Bekele needs to work more on consistency and it's all about the average, not the one-off. He was like, Bekele's going to, if Bekele runs New York, he's going to win easily because. Okay. He, yeah. He was very confident. He's like, Bekele, that's what he needs. He needs New York. He needs to not be going for world records. He needs to just going for wins. And who he'll, is he'll this person? It sounds like they're in tune with me. Was this Elliot Kipchoge? Because Elliot and I have been, you know, we've been texting a lot. No, so no. It makes sense. No, okay, not him. All right. Not the he's running uh, Boston. He's running Boston Marathon. That's the only hint I'll give you. Oh, interesting. Running Boston Marathon. Okay. All right. We're not. Okay. <laughs> you can't catch me. I'm, I'm gonna not going to. No, just kidding. I'm, no, I'm, I'm just no, stone face. <laughs> you can't, you can't, can't get me to. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in line with this mystery person, whoever he or or she may be. I I think that they're bringing up a lot of good points. I, I'm just saying that as a way to compliment my own point. But here, like, why didn't he try? And I know things got screwed up with the pandemic, but I feel like he should have done this pivot earlier. Once he realized that you're right, there's already a goat like that that's spoken for, and with this world record, it's gonna be hard to chase. Like his move should have been all right. Kale or all right, Kipchoge, you're going to rule over Berlin and London. I'm going to take New York and Boston. And that's yeah. where I'm going to make my living. And people always say they do this comparison where if someone's good in cross country, they think it means they're going to be a good hill marathon runner, which is like, I don't know, man, like that's a stretch. It's like eight or 10K on the grass is ultimately going to make you a better um, marathon runner in in races where there's hills but if it's flat it's not going to but McKaylee obviously has all that success in cross country so people have talked about it for a while i i I think that should have been his move before it may be too late now because he's 39 but at least we'll get maybe a glimpse of what was possible so i i just hope we end up actually seeing him do it and it's not a scratch or a dnf and i'm gonna be honest even if he were to break the world record it's not going to change the goat status of Ilya Kipchoge. Like, correct, correct. Lamont it's- Jacobs won the Olympic gold in the hundred, but none of us are saying he's the best sprinter in twenty twenty one. Trayvon Bromel has the fastest time in the hundred this year, but no one is saying he's the best hundred meter runner in twenty twenty one. Just because you had the fastest mark yeah, doesn't yeah. just guarantee you you're the best. It's about consistency, and DeGrasse and Curley showed that consistency in the hundred whereas and kipchoge has shown that the consistency career-wise in the marathon so yeah. that that actually be an interesting exercise go through all the world record holders in track and be like is this person the greatest ever in that event because you get you like you, you you look at bolt and you're like oh that's easy it's obviously bolt but like are people arguing that wade van niekirk is had a better had a better career than michael johnson 
Like I don't think many people are arguing that, even though his his PB was better. You know, eight. I mean, men's eight hundred. I guess it would work. Let's go through it right now. Usain Bolt, you'd say yes. Wade Van Eker, yeah. I would say no, right? Right. Because correct. Yeah. I feel like there's been more dominant people. David Rudisha, yeah, I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah. El Garouz, fifteen hundred yes. miles. Yeah. Yeah. Chepta guy, no, no, not yet. Yeah, His exactly. chance, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, the one hour track, Mo Farah. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm not gonna bring it up. 100%. Marathon, hundred percent. <laughs> uh, Marathon, Kipchoge, yes. Uh, one ten hurdles, Arius Merritt. No, I don't think people would say he's no. the greatest of all time. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, especially now that Holloway's about to break it. Warholm, I would say yes. You know, four hundred hurdles. Yes, he has enough enough consistency up there, and he's got all. But going back to the hurdles, it's like if Holloway opens up next year at a meet in Gainesville and runs 1279, no one's going to be like, yeah, it's him. Greatest. True. Because he ran two, because he ran two one hundredths of a second faster than his, his, his old PB, people are going to be like, he's the greatest of all time now. There needs to be me- more medals. It's a little more complicated on the women's side because some of those marks are out there. Yeah. Flojo, uh, you could – I don't think so. Right now, because right, I mean, career wasn't her career wasn't that long. So. Yeah, um, Marita Cock of in the four hundred. I don't think she people would say nineteen eighty five. Yeah, uh, an eight hundred. You have yeah, you have a you have a lot of the. How do you say her well, name? Kratos of the Kratos Kratos of the Kratos in the eight hundred. How about how about Dababa in the fifteen? Is anybody putting? Gababa ahead of Faith Kipiegon? No. No. Now, Kipiegon could get that mark. I mean, same thing with if Lincoln was here, he could G'day. go off on his rant about, about the pacing lights, about Gade in the five and the ten. Yeah. But, like, I mean, Safan Hassan is just, in terms of resumes, is just so far ahead because of what, what she's done. Hurdles, Harrison, I don't, would not be. And then women's formula hurdles. I mean, is Sydney the greatest of all time? Yet, I mean, you have. To I put, think soon will be. I think put, she's in the same category as like a Grant Holloway, where the, if they keep doing what they're doing, they're she's ahead of be, Grant. Ho- she's ahead of Grant Holloway. She's ahead of she's Holloway. Gold medal, in but it. like, oh, but like, she's just Muhammad. You, she needs to do it for you, five more years. You'd have Muhammad ahead of her right now because Muhammad has more gold medals. So you'd have Muhammad ahead of her right now, but it's possible within there. But my point would you have Muhammad ahead being, of her? Yeah, hundred percent. You have Muhammad ahead. Of her. How many Why gold medals does Muhammad have? She has two, and Sydney has one. And yeah, one yeah. of Muhammad's gold medals happened when Sydney was like sixteen. So like, I don't think yeah, you should so, take that away from from Sydney. Well, because Sid, but Sydney will get one like after Muhammad retires, though, too. But she's got the yeah. she's just, she's been around too long. To, I mean, she's got two silvers as well, too. She's she's got a a big body of work. So and the PBs aren't that much different. So I I'd, I'd still have it to Muhammad. So yeah, I mean, anyway. Beatrice Chepkowick in the steeple, I would say no, right? No, steeple's a younger event, but yeah. So just because you have the world record holder doesn't mean you're the goat. Long story short, so mm-hmm. that's what we're trying to get. To. So Adola won it. We didn't talk much about him. He gave Kipchoge a race back in the day, but have been really quiet since then so he gets back um with, with another win and then second was actually bethwell yagon but Caleb was third Caleb was third you wouldn't know that by how much we talked about him and then on the women's side uh go go tardum geber Selassie ran 220.09 her debut and then Haiwat geber kiden of ethiopia was second there um it's interesting to look at this though like you look farther down to find a you don't have to go that far down to find Shalane Flanagan, who ran the first leg of her fall marathon adventure here, Gordon, where she's trying to run six in seven weeks. What'd she go? 238? I have that right? 238? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Do you think she's going to regret doing that? I mean, she gave – she went 22 minutes s- under her goal. Like, I think it's funny. Maybe, maybe she wanted those minutes. Maybe she wanted extra rest. 
Maybe she, maybe she did some math and she's like, there's really not much of a difference between me running 238 and 258. And it gives me 20 less minutes on my feet and I can get recovery quicker. Maybe she's just that good. I don't know. I was surprised when I saw two, like I thought she would go well under three in this one, but I was like 238. We're going to see it come Yeah, back I was thinking like a two, 252 I was expecting. Something like that. By the end of this, are we just going to be like, wait a minute, Shalene Flanagan should just still be running regular marathons. <laughs> like she, she just keeps dropping the time by, by the end in, in New York. She's just running like a 231. Like, hold on. What if you didn't run a marathon every weekend? How fast would you be? I mean, the, the, the one that we're all waiting for is the Boston, right? Because 24 hours after Chicago, that's oh, yeah. when we're going to know the make or break. Yeah. I'm just, Right now she's London coming up. She should be fine there because they're two fast, yeah. two faster courses. Um, it's Boston yeah. after twenty four hours, a harder course. That's that's when we know whether or not she's going to do it. And she yeah. can't DNF because she has the goal. It's like a weird goal because yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you out, the goal ends, and it's like what's the point? So you have to finish. And maybe she changes her yeah. goal to just finish the marathons if she goes over three hours. But we'll see. I think she'll be, it'll be in play. I just think that's going to be the starting line at Boston is going to be like when, when Ron Burgundy chugs the milk and right. And he's like, milk was a bad decision. Like the first few strides are just going to be so <laughs> painful for her. like, I immediately regret this decision. Why did I do this? But you're right. That's the one, like, that's the one that we're all looking at and, and circling. I think she'll be fine in, in London this weekend. And then she'll be fine in Chicago. It's just going to come down to Boston. Yeah. On the women's side, uh, 220. It's a pretty good quick time for um, a debut. Gebra Selassie at 220. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at her. I'm looking at her resume here. So she ran a, a 6752 earlier this year. Uh, she's a world youth champ back in 2011 in the in a 3K. But yeah, just uh, has it has been on the roads, knocking out some. 67s some 68s um but but there was nothing here that's like oh yeah this person's for sure gonna be a for sure gonna be a star just a lot of consistent performances a lot of races in the united states as well too so she's a name to watch uh moving forward um she actually ran let's see is this it oh and she ran a pre in 2017 and got um fifth in the 3000 Oh, no, wait, sorry. She got 14th in the 5,000. I guess there was a in-route split there. So she's running the, she's, she's experienced at all, all the different surfaces, uh, cross country track and, and, and the roads. So yeah, keep an eye on, uh, Gebra Selassie of, of, of Ethiopia. Did you want to talk about, uh, cross country? Yeah. Why not? We Tell are me still everything doing the I need to know about cross country. Well, I'll dive even deeper in the second episode of the Cross Country Show presented by Gordon Mack. Um, but this past weekend, we had basically, I think, two, two notable, no, three. We had three notable races. We had a race out in Eugene, Bill Dillinger with the Oregon uh, Ducks and a few other teams. We had a, te a race in the middle of the country, Roy Griak in Minnesota, yep. where we had Iowa State going up against BYU. And then over on the East Coast, we had the Battle in Beantown where – Arkansas was there. The North Carolina women were there. Good action all around. The highlights from all three. I'll just do a quick 30 seconds on all three. Start on the West Coast. Bill Dillinger. Cooper Tier wins his season opener. His teammate Aaron Benfeld, a transfer from Cincinnati. Second. So Oregon has a great one-two punch. And the takeaway I get from this is the what if. What if Cole Hawker was also there? Because if Cole Hawker was there, they would have probably gone one, two, three in that race. And you'd be thinking potential team title chances. But without Hawker, it's more going to be about, you know, being a top 10 team and Cooper Tier being the mix to win it all. Uh, but Tier looked good. So he's going to be in the conversation with the Mances and the Kip Twos and all those guys when it comes down to Tallahassee. The women's side, uh, a red, sh not, uh, not red shirted, like a transfer from Europe. Izzy Thornton bot or something like that. She won, but she didn't run for Oregon. So she'll probably debut for Oregon in the next race. But uh, mm -hmm. the surprise there was the Utah women won easily, very dominantly. And they went from being not ranked in my rankings to being a top 15 team. So Utah women, 
uh, with a slew of transfers, did very well um, out in Dillinger. Moved to the middle of the country, Roy Griak. Um, it was a BYU-Iowa State battle. Basically a preview of potential Big 12, right? BYU and Iowa yeah. State going at it. Um, and sure. it was a close race. It's a difference of one or two points between the team, the teams. BYU beat Iowa State. But the individual battle between Kip Two and Connor Mance, very close. Mance pulls away at the very end, wins by about a second. But seeing what Kip Two did, Kip Two did not do the patent go out eight minute three K and then just try yeah. to kill everyone in the first, you know, mile or two. He's changing his race plan. Kip Two is now staying yeah. back with the pack and really only making the move later with the leaders. Um so that's going to be an interesting dynamic to see because last year everyone was talking about what do you do with Kip 2? He's going to go out really hard. You don't mm -hmm. want him to get too far out because how are you going to catch him? But yeah. the race plan has changed. No no Martin Smith there, obviously, as the coach, the new coach. Um, so they, you know, Jeremy Sudbury um, in his first year looks like he's changing it up with what Kip 2 is doing. And, uh, it, I mean, you can't say it didn't work. He still got second to the NCAA yeah. champion, so it's not the end of the world. But uh, uh, seeing a more strategic Kip to something that will be exciting to see how that plays out the rest of the year. Um, and then over on the East Coast, um, but BYU, they won. Um, by a point. The, the, by a point. So BYU still stays as a podium team. Iowa State, yeah. they only lost by a point, but I don't – the field – Here's the thing. I'll talk about more in a cross-country show. Just because you lose by a point to a team that I think will be a podium team doesn't make you all of a sudden like the fifth, sixth, or seventh best team. I still think Iowa State is like the 17th best team because mm. it's a lot easier for your fifth and fourth runners to score lower sticks in a diluted field than it is to score low sticks in a NCAA championship field. Anyway. Bean Town, save that for Arkansas, the show. Man. You gotta save that stuff for the show, man. You can't you give save away that for all the show. Uh, Hold on a second. Bean Town, Hold on a second. Ar Arkansas. Hold on. I gotta see. What? I gotta check something. Okay, just to let you know. I'm looking at the results from that meet, that Griak meet. Uh, yes. Festus got was a D, it was a DNS. So factor that in. Sorry, keep going. Your guy Festus, he wasn't in there. I'm just saying, don't oh, yeah, I know, don't bury boy. Iowa State yet. Festus wasn't there. Well, I moved them up from like. They were what? I did move them. They were just saying, don't count them out. I just, I'm not counting them out. What? What I had? Oh, hold on. Before we get to this, we'll see what I had. So I had Iowa State as 22nd, and then after this performance, I moved them up to 17th. So they moved up five spots. And if they but do did you well, no, at, at, at Prenas, yes, I did running. know. Okay, I did know. Just making sure. I, I knew that. I know. I know everything. I know who runs and who doesn't run. So, okay. um, Battle of Beantown, Arkansas went over there to Boston, Massachusetts, and they put four in the top five. Um, their top the four were all, yeah, the men. They were all the, the Kenyans of Chebasan, Moyne Kemboy, Andrew Kibet, and um, this, who's the other guy? I mean, this is practical. I got to be more prepared. Um, yeah. You do, straight up. Ken Boy, oh, Gilbert Boy, Gilbert Boy. So four Kenyans, all in Arkansas, running really well. They're, if Andrew Cabet, who was their fourth man, can run like that, Arkansas is going to be in contention to win. Um, yeah. It all comes down to having a really strong number four man. And if Andrew Cabet is that four guy for Arkansas, they're going to be hard to beat because, again, history says if you have the best four man in the NCAA – you win the, the national title. Now, yeah. Notre Dame has a pretty damn good four-man. Obviously, NAU's got a good four-man. BYU's got good four So there's other great four-mans out there. But Kibet, I thought, would be better last year. He's a transfer mm -hmm. from JUCO. Um, and basically, maybe he needed that year of like kind of get adjusted to the NCAA. And maybe now we're seeing actually what Kibet can be. Um, so Arkansas men look good. And last but not least, the North Carolina women. I'm excited mm -hmm. for them. Uh, Chris Miltenberg is doing something special with the North Carolina teams on both the men's and women's side. We saw Parker Wolf on the men's side win his season opener. But Bryn Brown, the true freshman at North Carolina, wins the battle in Beantown. North Carolina's team, 
is all freshmen except for one senior. It's incredible because, again, COVID and red shirting has caused three classes all to be freshmen because you have true freshmen, yeah. red shirt freshmen, and COVID red shirt freshmen. So there's a lot of opportunities to be a freshman, but it's kind of wild seeing North Carolina do well here with an all freshman crew except for one uh, senior and Paige Hofstad. But NC State obviously is the cream of the crop. They're the NCAA favorite to my mind. But NC State versus North Carolina, ACCs, is going to be something fun to watch. There could be a situation where potentially NC State could get upset at their own conference meet by this North Carolina team. Now, I'm not putting any money on it, but it is easier to beat a team at conferences than it is to beat a team at you know, NCAAs. We saw that Northern Arizona, they lost the Big Sky Championship and then went on to have a very dominant NCAA win at, at Cross Nationals. So yeah. I'm excited to see this North Carolina NC State battle, ACCs. Can't get here soon enough. Bryn Brown, true freshman, running well. Chris Miltenberg has gotten that program back to relevancy on both the men's and women's side. The women's team, now a top 10 team, in my opinion. Men's team, yeah. a top 15 team, in my opinion. So... That's the big storyline coming out of Battle on Beantown. It's the North Carolina women, all freshmen, looking good. And they're going to put some scare on the NC State Wolfpack, in my mind, come end of October. So That was a good recap. But I'll talk more about gonna, it on my cross-country show. Well, you probably should talk about the same amount of time on your cross-country show. No more, no less. It was a good amount of time. <laughs> uh, now here's my my response, my thoughts here based on your thoughts. Brim, I mean, Brim Brown wins by nine seconds too. That's a solid top yeah. margin of victory there too. So that was a good win. Uh, you neglected to mention Syracuse men top two because of the, you know, all the seniors coming back. We got another year of the dynamic name duo in Joe Dragon and JP Trojan. It's just, it's, I've been... I've been waiting for somebody else to take over the mantle of all name team, but like, because they keep coming back, like you're never going to do bet like a dragon and Trojan. Like, it's just never like someone they're going to need to graduate or someone going to need to supplant them. So what um, you need is you need those guys to get into politics and run for president and vice president and have a dragon Trojan <laughs> ticket or ticket? Trojan dragon ticket. That's what I want. Yeah. Yeah, let's. I mean, that's just a solid. And again, they've been not since Maverick Darling has someone dominated the all name competition for as long in as in the NCAA as as Dragon and Trojan have. I mean, it's just a real. And, and they've done it with two guys. You know, it hasn't all just been them. Now, Syracuse's third guy is Nathan Henderson. No disrespect to the name Nathan Henderson, but that's pretty. You know, it's pretty down the middle there. Now, that's not going to win you any any, any titles there, but. Again, you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get pretty far when you have those as your top two. The other thing I wanted to point out, we never really talked about this because it happened really can, quickly. Can, can, before you get, before you get to it, can I point out one thing about Syracuse? Uh, sure, Just but like your time real, is pretty much up. It's on. But like now. real talk wise, I rank Let's Syracuse. Hold on, I rank Syracuse ninth. They were eleventh last week. I rank them ninth this week. Do you know where they're ranked in the coaches poll? At least it's not out today, but yet, but. They're not even ranked in the top 30 in the coaches poll. I've mm. gotten texts from coaches being like, why is Syracuse ranked so high? Yeah. And I, they're ranked high because I know they're good. That's why they're ranked high. And they have two great names, like you mentioned. But they low-key. Yeah. I mean, Flowcheck's not sleeping on them because we're ranking them in the top 10. But the coaches are definitely sleeping on Syracuse. I think they're better than people think. Um, I think they're a top 10 team, not a 25 to 35 team. Anyway. So what's wrong with the coaches? What have the coaches been doing? They're not paying attention? Or they what? don't. They, oh, I, I'll go on another rant on the yeah, don't do the, I was the XC show. I, was, I, was, I have, I have, I have my thoughts on what the coaches think. So yeah, save that. Make that a tight, a tight three minutes and put that in the show. Okay, my other point, my last point in college cross country, and this is just not about cross country. It's about track. So track people listen up as well too. We never really talked about the conference realignment stuff because it happened when we were real busy with track, and it also went from, hey, this is going to be a massive deal. Every conference is going to change, and they're all going to be 16-team super conferences. And then it basically boiled down to just a few a few schools changing, which is consequential, but it wasn't a monumental shift yet. Yeah. But I'm looking at those ads for Big 12, the, the teams that they added. And from a football perspective, if you consume a lot of college football content, you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, the Big 12 didn't disintegrate, so good for them. But 
is it really adding anything as as a power conference when you add Cincinnati and Houston and BYU and what was it Central Central Florida? But but I don't look at things from a college football perspective. I look at things from a track and cross country perspective, and I see okay, yeah, the Big Twelve lost Texas, which is a solid solid track program, lost Oklahoma. But then you add BYU. <laughs> Hold on. What? <laughs> lost I mean, Texas, which is a solid track program. Lost Oklahoma. The silence. <laughs> I mean, what? How would you describe Oklahoma I right mean, now? Yeah, they're not that good. They ever since Martin Smith it's, left, they haven't been good. But yeah, right. But it's so. it's not any different. It's not any different. It's not like Oklahoma in football, right? It's not any. They're not yeah, any exactly. Yeah. They don't distinguish themselves in in track across country any more than those schools. And then you add, okay, you add BYU, one of the dominant distance programs. So cross country and distance events get way more competitive. And then you add Houston, which is one of the best sprint programs. So then you have a, a, a conference that has just really dynamic sprinting in it as well, too. Like from a track and cross country perspective, it made it really interesting, I think. And yeah. it took B, because BYU was in West Coast Conference. For distant stuff, but for and and track, right? So it's like they went from being in a mid major, I don't know, and you know, whatever, power five. They make up these terms every few years to 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 differentiate. But just a much more competitive conference for both of those schools. And those schools were competing at that level already. So those conference championships are just gonna be a lot more exciting. And I'm guessing recruiting is gonna benefit benefit. I mean, I don't know BYU, it's a different scenario because of, of their setup over there, but for Houston, I'm sure it helps as well too, because now they're in the the Big Twelve. Yeah, you could the the removal or addition of an Oklahoma doesn't really change much track wise, but the the loss that you get from losing the Texas distance and the Texas sprints, you gain more by trading yeah. away Texas yeah. sprints and Texas distance by adding BYU distance and Houston sprints. Yes, so yeah. it's the conference got just much better on both ends. Of the spectrum, yeah. which is great, and like you mentioned, uh, Iowa State BYU that duel is now going to be a conference duel, and then when you throw yeah. in Oklahoma State, you know, a BYU Iowa State Oklahoma State in their prime, like there could be yeah. a chance where this conference could have three podium teams, which would be incredible. Yeah. I'm not sure, has it ever happened where three teams from the same conference have all podiumed? That would be a stat someone could look up. Yeah. US I mean, I would imagine Listen. potentially Pac-12, right? With a, like a Stanford, Oregon, Colorado, something. when they were Colorado. Colorado. Yeah, yeah. But, Look, I mean, like Texas is solid because they're they're good all around, right? You see them; they're they're good in the field. Yeah. They're they're good at sprints. You know, they have distance runners as well too. But the but the pure power of, of Houston, and you also get the sense, and I know nothing lasts forever, but you also get the sense. Burrell and Carlos built that thing to last, I think. And they've just yeah. done it now enough times to where you see it. And BYU obviously has this rich tradition and they invest so heavily in distance that you have to think they're going to be able to keep that going now. It's not just going to be a, hey, this coach was here and they're really good and now it's going to disappear. Now they might have some lulls like every program does, but with, with Eyestone and, and Taylor there, it just seems like every year they're going to be podium contenders at the very least. And just the track... I mean, you go to try to win a conference title in that. Like, think of the schools you have to get through uh, on, like, the sprint and distance side of things, right? I mean, because – Yeah, sprints... well, th there's a go time – I mean, when following the Big 12, like, Texas kind of would win a lot because, like, Iowa State and Oklahoma State would just beat up each other in the mm -hmm. distance events so that the they could still – they were just, like – solid in all of it so texas could pull away but now you're not going to have like that solid team in all the events because byu is yeah. going to have a major weakness houston's going to have a major weakness all the other teams now have major weaknesses where it's going to be a lot more parity in the deciding who wins the conference championship because a lot of yeah, times texas could pull away because they just be solid in everything but there's no team now that's going to be solid in everything it's going to be like Really good BYU distance, really good Houston sprints, TCU good in sprints, you know, back and forth. Yeah, well, Baylor, right? Look, I mean, look yeah, at the teams Baylor. that have put out like monster sprint programs or at least athletes. Baylor has been really good. TCU has put up 
big numbers, and Texas Tech has has put up big numbers. So you throw Houston in there, and then on the, on the flip side with distance, you know, like you mentioned, you got Iowa State in there that's been really solid, and then you have um, Oklahoma State, and then now BYU. So you have you have the numbers there, and I like it when it's not just two teams. And I think in both on the sprint and the distance side, it's at least three teams that you can envision being really competitive for a long time. It was just one of those weird things where you're hearing everybody talk about it's like from a perspective of football. And I'm like, well, I don't know, man. Like this cross country meet got pretty, pretty good. I know that's not what yeah. you're, uh, what you're measuring it on. Thinking about. Pretty, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and then from the, so then you look at SEC, right? You look from the SEC perspective, Texas going there, obviously just good all around program. Um, so they'll like, you know, just add to the strength of, of that, of that conference. And then I guess I mean, cross country wise, the men would be in a pretty good spot. I mean, but see, you're talking about how great, you know, Alabama is right. And Arkansas, it was like, yeah, it, they're tough all across the board. It just um, SEC is, is like a three team conference, Ole Miss, Arkansas, and Alabama when it comes to cross country, cross country. Yeah. So yeah, those are like the, always the, like the three solid ones. Right. So throwing Texas right. there, there'll be like enough war. Yeah, and, and I guess they would need to improve a little bit to get to that. Otherwise, they're going to be stuck in between yeah. the the two tiers. But then on the on the sprint side of things, it's like SEC is like it seems like every school has you know a standout every now and then, and usually multiple standouts. But Texas will Texas will fit right in there as as well. Too. Yeah, what's, and that'll obviously change the recruiting too. What's interesting about SEC? Um, maybe this is like a weird stat to come up with. But I feel like a majority of SEC finals, they have the most parity in who gets points in any given event. Like, I feel like most of their yeah. events, six teams are getting points in every event. Yeah. Because like, yeah. they yeah. rarely have, like, I mean, outside of distance, because Arkansas could, like, rack it up or almost could rack it up. But, like, in a sprint event, you rarely see Florida get, like, five people in the final or at A&M get five people in the final or whatever, right. or LSU. It's always like one LSU, one Florida, one, two A&M, one Vanderbilt or whatever. You know, it's like yeah. very spread out. Now they had Texas in there. One Texas person is going to get in that final. And now it's like, it's going to be weird. It's just going to be a lot of colors on the track every, every final, because you're not going to see three Longhorns or three, you know, Aggies. You're just going to see one of everything. Well, you look at the teams and you th you can think of absolute superstars from those teams all in the recent memory, right? Like you can name Alabama superstars, Georgia, Auburn, Tennessee, Arkansas, Florida, LSU, like you mentioned, Texas A&M, like South Carolina, like and in a variety of events too. It's not just like, oh, they had that yeah. one guy in the 400. It's like, oh no, they had that really good triple jumper and the high jumper and they also had a good four by one that year. You're, you're right. Like a lot of them yeah. are like very balanced and some of them, you know, they're more consistent throughout the years and then some of them have these you know where they pop and they get a great four by four out of nowhere but yeah texas will texas will be good in that conference obviously they'll they'll, they'll slide right in obviously it'd be a challenge but i think the the benefits um there are pretty evident and then i i like that new big 12 like i like that new big 12 i mean maybe maybe central florida now that they're moving up i mean obviously that's a hotbed for for sprints the state of florida so who knows i like that phrase i like that new big 12 that's a t-shirt. You, like, you, you like the new Big 12? I like that new yeah. Big 12. Wait, well, who are the four teams that went? BYU, UCF, Houston, and who was the fourth team? Uh, Cincinnati. Was it Cincinnati? Cincinnati, they low-key got some good uh, runners uh, occasionally. I mean, Aaron Benfeld, who's now running at Oregon as like yeah. a fifth year, he's like a legitimate like 1330 type guy. So even Cincinnati will throw in a couple – fast individuals here and there to kind of mix it up. So it's going to be good. Yeah. Good, good, good thrower too. A couple years ago as well too. Yeah. Um, all right. Is there anything else you want to talk about or do you want to leave it there? Uh, want to talk a little about high school cross country. NXN got canceled. Mm -hmm. However, they're still holding the regionals. I saw that. What? And they're doing a California regional. Yeah. So, do we know why they can't? Are they canceling because of COVID? Is that why they're canceling? Or are they canceling because of think... budget? It's a good question, Gordon. What do we all well, What do you say? think it is? What, is it all... what it all? Well, everything comes down to money. 
Everything comes yeah. down to money. So the, it's so not COVID. Things. It's it's money. Well, I don't, I'm giving my opinion. I think th- I think those two things combined to make it where you're like, all right, we're not gonna do it. We talked about this with the, was, the first year. It's not yeah. just it's not just a race, right? It's this huge long event. You bring in all these teams from all out the country and you try on the gear, and it's just a big ad an expo. For Nike. Yeah, yeah, that goes on for for so it can't be cheap. It cannot be cheap. So, but they're still doing things in these regions. So, but those I bet are done more with local people i would guess so and not teams as big. are yeah the teams are responsible for their own transportation so i mean the the part of me that remembers when it was just one high school championship back and they'd be like everybody's gonna go to Foot Locker, but i don't know i don't know where everybody's loyalties are nowadays it would be <coughs> cool to have a you know one i'm you know i like it when you knew who the champion was and there wasn't this big never ending debate because this person ran this race and this person ran that race. Although I guess that's just good for conversation and good for topics to, to have people not race each other. But with all these all-star meets and postseason meets popping up, I'm sure they'll be missing a key team or a key individual at one of these meets. So if NXN is, you know, if we're on an agreement that we think it's a budgetary reason, do you think there's a chance that NXN continues to have that budget and not doesn't bring back NXN in 2022? Well, let me clarify. I think it's a budget thing combined with COVID, right? Because you could make, if you were guaranteed to make up all the money, right, then you make the risks worth it, right? Just as we've seen throughout yeah. these things with m- m- like marathons, it's like we're canceling it, um, right? But then once you can have enough assurances around the safety combined with the fact that, hey, we know that this many people are going to show up because last thing you want to do is have a race and not have people show up. Then for them, it was, it was worth it. So no, I think they'll be back and I think they'll be back in okay. 2022. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll figure out a way to, to scale it a bit differently. I mean, there was all that talk. When was that? I am losing track of time, right? About Nike scaling back on their running budget, but that was more like pro running. Like, I, I'm sure yeah. that that's a different, that's probably a different, you know, because a lot of the people who were instrumental in advocating internally for more Nike money um, were no longer with the company or taking different roles. But I'm sure that's a different budget, I'm guessing. And this is more in the grassroots development, let's get more people aware of our shoes sort of phase of it. Um, I mean, it, there's no doubt it seemed, see, from the outside, when I watch it and all you see is all the, kids Instagram posts and all this other stuff that week, you're like, wow, this is wildly effective. They've just managed to get Nike products in front of everybody for an entire, at least a couple days. And then that's the headline coming out of it. And that's the main story. You know, they, they put it at a time when that's the main story because it's in December. There's no major marathon going on. So to me, it always looks successful, but I don't know the numbers, right? I don't know if yeah. that's converting into the type of income that they want to see. The one thing I'm kind of taking away from it though, is like there is some domino effect that is occurring. One, they're adding a California regional, which is kind of weird, right? Because you're going to race everyone in your state championship again. And then you like, what, what, well, it would be having a second state championship. It'd be like a meet of champions, right? Because California is divided into so many, classifications so that way the, the the big schools can race the small schools that that's what it would say but, but can't you argue that they already race a lot as it is like because don't you have to go through like four rounds to get to state in the first well, place or something like that yeah but those are all sectionals and those are divided out by population too but yeah so you you could have a situation where there's a really good small school runner who doesn't have the who from a different part of the state never gets to race the Newberry Parks, for example, of the world. And this this would could be that opportunity. So obviously a week ago or so, Newberry Park, the the uh, the young twins, um, and the other guys running incredible fast times at Woodbridge, mm-hmm. they were obviously a team that was on everyone's mind for NXN. They yeah. apparently have announced that they are going to commit to the running lane championship which actually originally was on Thanksgiving weekend, but now got moved mm-hmm. to the time slot of 
NXN on December 4th. So Alabama, the me and Alabama potentially could be that de facto team championship that the high schoolers are kind of clamoring for that NXN, the, the void that NXN left. Um, yeah. Do you think we'll, do you think running lane will be able to garner enough of the top teams to be able to kind of put together a champion that people can say, yeah, you're the best team. Yeah. I mean, it just, a lot of it too depends on the year, right? Cause if you have a clear favorite yeah. and it's like, all right, they went to this meet and six of the top 10 were there. That's enough evidence for me. They're the, they're the champions. But if it's a year where there's like four or five teams, then it's going to be, it's going to be tough. I, I mean, I guess now the poll is so strong with this team concept, right? That people would, they'll, enough people would rather do this than, than pursue Foot Locker. Is that the thinking? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, well, running lane is like trying to, apparently they seed it according to Miles Splits. I, I, I should look more into this because Miles Split is our co a colleagues over at the Miles Split call them. headquarters. We should, probably, we should call Corey and Brian and ask them what's going on because they probably know a little bit more about the high school details than we do. Um, but I think they're trying to like formulate the the race so that the best individuals can be racing against the best teams and they create this mm -hmm. whole algorithm to make sure they're all at the same race at the right time. I do yeah. wonder though, like it would have been cool potentially to see like Newberry Park try to qualify five guys to Foot Locker. <laughs> and yes. then all of a sudden like yes. they just have their own team at Foot Locker at an individual um, championship and they could be like, hey, yes. yeah, we uh, put – but now yeah, they're so not going to be able to do that, though, because just so people Foot Locker, know, West, Foot Locker Regional West, League. yeah, exactly, is the yeah. same day as Running Lane, right? Yeah, those so. those two meets overlap. Right? So, um, yeah, I'm I'm with you on the because <laughs> if you had everybody just go to Foot Locker and Newberry Park was able to qualify that many people, it would be a ridiculous feat, which I think would be like, yeah. a fun thing for them to pursue, right? This Newberry team, though, reminds me of that American Fork team with Casey Klinger. Um, mm -hmm. I forget the other guys who were on it. Uh, Johns McKay and someone else. Well, they had like a big three. I think they all went to BYU. Um, it was a few years ago. But they lost. I think they ended up losing at NXN. Um, and I did a whole analysis on it that it's teams with like three stars. Yeah. You, you don't. The thing about cross country scoring is you could have like, there's just like your three stars could beat everyone else's by like two minutes, but you still only yeah. get one place better than them. And yeah. it's like, yeah, I just beat you by two minutes and I finished fifth and you finished sixth and you're two minutes back of me. It's like, what's going yeah, on? Yeah. But because of depth of high school cross country, weird things yeah. like that can happen where it's, you could have a really slow see. number three runner and beat just as good. Yeah. yeah, it's just funny to see the national championships when there's like a huge pack at like 17, 15. Because yeah. there's like everybody's cuz cuz on a on a team like where you have three guys who are 15, it's like, yeah, okay. Fill them out with 17 guys. That's pretty good. That's, that's pretty good team. It's going to win you a lot of meets, but then you go to the national championships, it's like, oh wow, there's a lot of these guys. So NXN California region is that same day too, the 4th. So they've piled everything on the same day, which again, I get why they're doing it. Doesn't mean I have to like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. It was cool back in the day. It, it was back in the day, Gordon. I know. I'm saying it. I'm saying the phrase back in the day. Um, cross country was the only sport where in high school where it's like we know who the national champion is. No other sport had the postseason that cross country did. Yeah. Where it was like very clear. You got four regions, and it used to be eight per region, not ten, right? Everybody had an opportunity to go. Yeah, some people's seasons end. Utah's ends in October and California ends way later, blah, blah, blah. Okay, there's going to be some inherent disadvantages, but everybody can get to the meet, right? Everybody runs, and then you literally know who the best people are. Right? You can't do, you couldn't do that in any other sport in high school. And then it got complicated. And now we have meets on the exact same day. That's, well, what, that's what I'm saying. From a, Listen, if I was in high school and I had the opportunity to run more with my team, high school me would have loved it, would have been all about it. But I'm just saying from yeah. someone who 
followed the sport, it was it was cool to know, hey, Ritz, Webb, and Hall, man, we're going to see those three guys on the same course, and it's going to be insane, right? Like, because also back then, they didn't have as many all-star meets. They had some, you know, they, yeah. they raced at Arcadia, Arcadia here and there, but you actually got to see, and there was no doubt throughout the year. It wasn't like, which meet is Alan Webb going to go to? Is Ryan Hall going to commit to NXN or Foot Locker? It's like, no, no, no. They're going to be there, and we're going to see them race, and it's going to be awesome. And it was just big. It was just, just the whole season was building towards it and building towards it. You'd get on your 56K modem and be like, meow, meow, let's look at some let's look at some pictures from the race. And they would slowly load. And who won? A carrier pigeon told get the, the, me. It was Ritz. Go to go on the newspaper and page the page B12 and see who won. Check out the results. Yeah, and, printed. In, and in it's a typo point, of your name. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. See, you know. You know, you're not an old enough. You're not an old enough. But no, I like the internet. Um, I'm glad the internet came along, but <laughs> I also, I also liked knowing, I mean, can you imagine an NCAA cross? It's like, we have a team championship and an individual championship and they're completely separate. You got to pick Connor Mance. You want to run for your team or do you want to run for yourself at an individual champion? It was, uh, I mean, we like, kind of do was... get that. We get that a little bit when like people opt for the DMR versus an individual event. Like when Yared sure, Goose isn't but... running the indoor mile. Yeah. Yeah, like but that's happens. one that's one event within it though and he has opportunities in outdoor and in, and in cross too i just there was clarity and i liked the clarity to it and i liked the idea of hey there's these two people on opposite ends of the country and they're just killing you know every race like they're crushing everybody in their state and in their region and they're not going to ever race this other person across the country but they're doing the same thing and we know in december they're going to meet in well, in Florida or in California, wherever Nationals was, and we're going to get to see. Because it's okay, hard so to compare across for... country courses. So here's a question for you. At NCAAs, what are you more looking forward to? Seeing who wins between Mance, Kip2, Tier, et cetera, or seeing who wins between NAU, Notre Dame, Arkansas? What are you more excited I about? I mean, this year or just – like, because it depends on the year. In general. In general. Oh, and in... – what are you what are you watching more the individual battle or the team battle what are you watching more just that be is, honest and so i can so i can say my point i mean that's that's tough like mcdonald and fisher like i was in on mcdonald and fisher i mean probably more than okay here before i worked for flow individual since i worked for flow team because i have to talk to you about oh, okay. it okay there you go Okay, because what I was saying is like, if people are more excited about the team, uh, who's going to win the team battle, NC State or BYU on the women's side, you don't get that at Foot Locker, and that's why NXN was born, right? So we could have right. people care about Newberry Park and not Nico Young. You know? But here's the difference, though. Like, I know BYU's roster. I know NAU's roster. I know NC State's roster, right? I know BYU women's roster. Like, they were all superstars, right? So I'm, like, invested in, like, their fourth and fifth person. Like, Nico Young could be their fourth and fifth guy, Luis Carvalho. In high school, it's really impossible to expect somebody to know uh, Conshohocken Valley's third guy, right? Like, yeah. I'm just not going to – I'm not going to know that. And, it, like, it's really unreal. And, number one, a lot of them aren't running that fast. And, number two, there's just so many of them. But, like, in college, it's like – those people are all so good. Of course, I'm going to know yeah. them, right? It's like Anna Camp for BYU. She's the 1500-meter NCAA champion, and she's going to be – I mean, she might be BYU's number one, but she also be BYU's number four. But, like, we know that person. Like, we know her story, her yeah. her, her career. You just don't – you don't get that in, in high school. Well, maybe you well, do like that. if you follow Model Split. They probably tell those stories. We just, we're just not – Well, not but, but, like, which team – Okay, a team good enough to where you'd know their third and fourth person is going to destroy everybody, a la Newberry Park, right? Yeah. Like, if you've, ro if you've risen to the level of fame where we know your third and fourth runner, you're really damn good because they're obviously yeah. running elite times. But you like how I snuck in that Conshohocken, in Pennsylvania reference there? You're welcome. That was, that was one for the I appreciate folks that. out there. I always love when Pennsylvania gets a shout out. No problem, no problem. All right, we'll leave it there. Podcast at gmail.com. We'll be back. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. We're going Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday.
because of Gordon's uh, time constraints. Thanks to Colt for producing. We might be live on Wednesday. We'll try to tune in. We'll definitely be live Thursday and then Sunday morning, 2.30 a.m., London Marathon Watch Party. Join me and Kathleen Dennehy. We'll talk to you guys next time.